First of all, in one of those absurd situations when one is looking at portfolios, quite at random, didn't know who the guy was, just 
happened to come upon it in some funny way. And, and for the precise reasons that it gets up Alvin's nose, I found it absolutely <laughs> engaging and fascinating. And mm. for the reason that, that I, I think that one of the most interesting aspects of architecture as analyzed, or architecture as one rather self-consciously can play with it, is to see what happens to a set of ideas at the point of their maximum disintegration. To, to, to take, and in this case perhaps the metaphor is a, is a simple one, which is an existing building, but to see what happens to that set of forces, that set of spaces, ideas, <coughs> arrangements, whatever, and push it and push it and push it to the point where it practically disintegrates. And I think, and, and, and I remember years ago having the same attitude in, to something quite different, which is the, the notion of system building. I remember feeling for a period of time that system building could get really interesting if one could take a system and pervert it, coerce it, warp it, misuse it, push it to the point at which it virtually became inert, but not quite. Or if one could take a geometry, let us say, and play with it and contort it and, and, and ditch it and, and be eccentric to it, but not totally. A, and somewhere in, in, in my mind there is a, there's a sort of magic territory, which is where the thing is still traceable back to its origins. And where it hasn't, I mean, anybody can sort of blow the thing sky high and say, right, to hell with that, you know. But to still retain some elements of it, but to be contorting it, I, I think is a very sort of magic experience. And that was precisely, it's rather curious, that it's precisely the quality that, as I say, got out of Alvin's nose, that I found absolutely fascinating about this. I thought, my God, yes, you know, a, a, a distorted, a, a, a kind of creepy, dying, warped, almost untraceable bars of Caracal is infinitely more fascinating than the original thing, which can be, you know, Vitkova or somebody could go through that like a fine tooth curve and explain why it's all like this. But somewhere there is a point, and, and this is really a kind of paradigm of one's view of architecture as a whole, that the, the tradition of architecture is useful um, up to the point at which one can actually um, distort it or pervert it. And it is still useful while one is in the process of perverting. If one does a total perversion, then it, you know, then, then one's got nothing. And this, this is why, and, and I think that it's interesting that in a sense, um, although the, the, the second project, and I know how you personally feel about this early, this Caracalla thing, but that's some of the past you did at Rhode Island and all of that, and really you're into something that's much more fascinating, and you almost, as I remember, embarrassed about it. Um, in a way, the, the statement of, a, of an objective, and you do state a certain kind of objective, albeit warped and almost impossible to achieve, of a sort of biomorphic architecture, in a funny way, I think that is a much more traditional thing to be doing, uh, in the sense that there is a consistent program, albeit that the consistent program doesn't lead to a consistent set of, of, of devices, but there is a a sort of total program of trying to evolve this other architecture, which which is the opposite of this other scheme. This is this is decadent. That is optimistic. You know, that is heroic. This is decadent. This is the end of this contortion and, and the, you know withering embers. But that is back into the tradition of heroism and looking forward and so on. Um, and that, that's curious. I mean, the, the, the new drawings are much more elegant, which goes without saying. Um, could I, could I uh, come in? So I agree that perhaps that's a more optimistic statement. But, uh, but as far as Peter has introduced a sort of autobiographical element in discussing your work, uh, perhaps one should <laughs> pick it up just a little bit. And um, this whole... Uh, description of a personal struggle against uh, a mark on paper or a form or a set of facts, which may or may not be culturally loaded for the individual manipulating them, as it seems, system building or, or the bats of Karkala. But um, 
it could be a fantastic, it's sort of like somebody going into a gymnasium and kind of, I don't know, throwing a ball against the wall simply for the sweat and developing fantastic rhythm of uh, rebounds off various facets of, of the gymnasium and so on, and coming up with some kind of fantastic uh, feeling of pleasure and, and achievement and all the rest of it. But on the other hand, if you uh, are asking some questions of yourself and producing some kind of analytical uh, sort of, if you leave a, a trail of analysis behind you, uh, which can be loaded in many ways, and on the, on the other hand, you seem to be bending the facts as you discover them uh, willfully in some special direction which can be traced as an idea and so on. There is a dialectic, there is a conflict, and there is, uh, if not heroic uh, outcome, at least some kind of resolution to problems which you may not have begun with but have been engendered by the whole business. But I, 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 my objection to this is not uh, the fact that it is no longer a vid Kilburn sort of diagram at the end of it, but that it's impossible really to describe uh, the experience of the person doing it and the kind of resolution he came to. Uh, the, the, the final product is a sort of non-event with regard to the potential of the beginning. And I, I think it's on, on that basis, uh, autobiographically, sort of, or, you know, as a, an experience in time, it's a sort of a failure, you know, in that sense. And as for the uh, other part of the work, I haven't really had the time to explore it. And it's as with Mark Fisher's work, there's a sort of a, a mystic belief, you know, that a return to the atom and to genetics and to ecology and so on, uh, we'll find a new route. Now, I mean, I don't want to get involved in expanding that into problems of our time and looking for new beginnings. But I would say that it's a worthwhile research, you know, and um, we all look forward to elegant drawings like the one in the bottom right-hand corner, and also into uh, some kind of uh, triggering of other people's sensibilities which comes from it. And, and I look forward to that part of your work a great deal. That's what's coming. Yeah, I mean, in, in conclusion, probably I'll not make any, any contribution to what was said already, but uh, there's still more interesting thing on the way. See, what I find very interesting, your choice, and uh, I've seen already several examples like that being done, very actually rarely with success, because it's a bloody difficult thing. I mean, it's very easy to make a statement at the beginning and say, you know, pick up any building you want. I don't think it's really matter which one you pick. But once you've done the decision, you are in it, and you are in the game, you're playing it, and if you like it or not, you know, the scene or the situation is playing it with you. And now it depends very much how strong you are. And I think, you know, there's something like a challenge. And the, you know, the easy start is always becoming a much more, much more difficult to uh, end. Because if you don't end up with something which is at least bears the challenge, then you're making, well, to say the least, full of yourself, or you're wasting time, or you just, uh, you lost the challenge simply. <coughs> so I don't want to say what is the outcome of that, because, you know, one can see it. But uh, it's a pity that, you know, what was left on the way, that's what I really want to talk about, is, uh, is something which uh, wasn't really used. It's something like, again, a gap becoming a cross here, that, you know, we are obviously convinced with your assumptions and whatever you said at the beginning, you know, fair enough, you know, it is nothing specially original, but it's uh, still very interesting because so often failed, failed uh, possibilities that you take something seriously into a dialogue and confront it. And, you know, we'll see what happens in confrontation, but then you have to take all the responsibility for the outcome. And, you know, in that case, uh, you know, God be with you. Uh, I, again, I don't want to make the conclusion just repeat what was said. I think I'll probably not uh, say very much different. You know, we can see that this can be continued and maybe taken again in a much, much more serious way. Not serious in bloody old-fashioned way, but, you know, sense of that, but you know, seriously, in terms of exploiting what is really involved in the game you take here. Because it will tell you something about yourself, I think. You know, that's something which is probably even more interesting than, you know, just playing game with already uh, outdated and, 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 uh, 
integrated uh, uh, in issues. I'm much more interested actually in the second one, which again, I feel rather, rather sort of perplexed, not knowing enough about the, the invisible, as this seems to be referring so much to. So it's very great dangerous to admire the drawing, which one can very easily, if you have certain sensibility, uh, uh, reading graphics, uh, you got uh, you know the message through that level, but uh, apparently that's not what the thing is about. Now, what you said at the beginning, and I don't want to ask you to talk more, but definitely what you said so far, I'm more more sort of uh, uh, rather put off than put on. I find it very dubious, and in fact, I guess that as more as you will be talking, there will probably be greater and greater conflict between the invisible intention, I mean, you know, the content of your, again, thinking and, and uh, your sort of ideas about possibilities, how you can manipulate, you know, the micro world in relation to the macro in which you operate uh, with your drawing. Because, you know, it's a very difficult, very difficult, again, uh, challenging world to go into, far more difficult than what you started with. What I, in then, just to end up, you know, the, the comment I'm making, uh, what I find very interesting about that, that you seem, and I, I admire it, and also, you know, taking the challenge, that you seem to be somehow obsessed with the kind of dialogue which uh, you take, you know, you can take and turn into challenge. What I found frustrating and to a certain extent, well, it's probably too early to say disappointing, that you don't seem to finish the job. You're somehow sort of impatient. You know, I mean, I don't know what you're going to do now, or what you're doing now, if you're sitting at home and working on that, but it seems to me that uh, even if you will describe it more in detail, that it's still a just open sort of uh, possibility without saying the right word in the right place in the right moment, which means turning it at least to a provisory a conclusion. You know, when you have really to face the challenge you started with, because that's really where you face your stuff in a mirror and it's either distorted or it's uh, straight. So far, you avoid the possibility to see yourself in a mirror. Well, that's just a question. I think that's what you are artificially more or less simulating, trying to, to do here. You know, the mirror is part of the conversation we're leading here. Well, there's another way of saying the position, saying, you know, you should really do that. There's another way of saying that. If, mm -hmm. if this botanic architecture is really going to uh, progress and so on, uh, it's not uh, self-induced graphics and uh, sort of graphic techniques of finding a few facts about microbiome and so on, but it requires a, a heavy scientific basis. It means you have to hang up your pencil for a long time mm -hmm. and get yourself to a point where you're in control of the, um, of the vocabulary you're dealing in this potential. Maybe not. Maybe you can intuitively uh, spark off notions which other people are better equipped, but I mean, you know, given the paths open to one in the world of building at this point in time, you know, they're well marked. You either do your best given the circumstances or you try to develop alternative services and alternative ways of solving problems, or you're trying to produce ideas which will transform uh, what will happen in years to come. But I I if you take that route, and you leave the action, the field of action, so to speak, in the real world, then that has to have a fantastic self discipline. <coughs> has to have a spot in your material. Sure, sure, but <coughs> to contrast that with uh, with the previous work, I'm not what I'm not I'm not calling for scientists to get together and integrate this, you know, and, and manipulate nature. I mean, that's not if that's the idea you've got. No, I'm not. I'm, I'm just putting the two together. Yeah, well I to me, they're worlds apart. Yes, yeah. problems. Yeah, I'm talking about the natural evolution, mm -hmm. which would come from from man, from a growing awareness of man, and, and, and a growing closeness with with the natural system, and in a, in a, in a process of throwing off of, of, of the technology that we have today, which which is, has been a substitute for man's physical evolution. Anyways, you know. uh, well, this gets into a number of quotes. I mean, one of which is is the fact that that it's man's tools that have evolved rather than man physically. The fact that, that you or I have as many hair follicles in our body as, as an ape or a gorilla. You know, it's our, it's our hands, our minds, and our tools that have evolved. 
and, and history shows that evolution generally leads to extinction because, because the species evolves physically, become more and more specialized to environment, the environment changes and, and that's it. You know, but the, the wonderful thing about man is that in a cool primitive state, he's still capable of living you know, in, in the Arctic and he's capable of living in the Sahara. And it's the tools that become more and more specialized. And, and the way it looks, it's the tools that will work their way towards extinction. With any, with a little bit of uh, luck, man might might survive it. And to survive it, he's going to have to develop this alternate technology. And that's yeah. what it's all about. Yeah, uh, that's what I wanted to ask. Actually, you and um, Mark, had he been able to stay, it would have been nice actually to 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 ask you close together. I'm very interested in that second project and also in what he was talking about and wonder whether you've obviously read a lot more than I have about all this and whether you, these are what you have drawn and what Mark has drawn are, are science fiction dreams of what might happen in the future when we are much more aware of nature than we are at the moment but I'm wondering whether there are any at the moment there are some whether there's whether you found in your reading some some evidence of think the beginnings of this actually happening, uh, whether you see some present examples of of uh, man manipulating nature to this extent, well not to this extent, but even the beginnings of, of this. Well, I can't I can't couldn't think of any real sources to quote other than a few individuals. People like Lauren Isley or, or even Bernowski. And that's the type of thing that I'm that, that I'm concerned with. I'm not concerned with the genetics, with the, you know, the mutations, with all of that. Mm -hmm. but, uh, but the idea is that, that hopefully everybody is driven subconsciously or, or even lower, deeper than the subconscious level by some image of the future. Yeah. And that's what carries them on, you know. And if the image of the future is ugly, if it's if it's overpopulation, if it's all this garbage, mm. then it leads to certain things. It leads to revivals of past crazes, you know, it leads to celebration of the destruction, you know, which is something I think Venturi does a little bit of, you know. And and that doesn't get anywhere. And the idea is that if you can if you can plan another picture of the future down there, then it, it, it without a doubt it will lead to something better. Yes, but you must be relying on on uh, manipulating nature to no. no. Yeah. You seem to think it's gonna happen. Well, good, well you know there, well. there are a lot of <laughs> a lot of crackpots around, you know. I mean you, you, there are books like Secret Life of Plants. There are there are, there are many you know, more and more people these days are talking to the plants and more and more people are, <laughs> are enjoying plants and, and and there's well I could get I could, all right, I will. I'll tell you a very interesting story. Oh, well, I consider it to be an interesting story out of a book uh, called The Parable of the Beast by a guy named Lee Trout. I don't yes. know if I'm pronouncing his name right. But, mm -hmm. uh, but in this book, he's talking about the pineal gland. Mm -hmm. he's, he's stating that, that nobody really knew what it was all about until very recently, except for the ancient Hindus who knew what it was about. And, uh, and recently, they found that, well, 17th century French philosophers felt that it was the bridge between the body and the soul because it was located in your spinal column, it's your brain, it's just, just this little gland that's found that it produces these, these hormones that act as a balancing agent on your brain and, and if the pineal gland is upset and the hormones are not produced at the right quantity then you get schizophrenia in one form, clinical schizophrenia, you know, it could be anything. And then they found that, say, LSD works on the pineal gland and it creates this schizophrenia. And then it was pointed out that uh, that the major hormone of the pineal gland is chemically identical to uh, certain plant hormones, and particularly certain fig hormones. And the one fig that it's most prolific in was called by the Indians the bow tree. And it was a bow tree that the Buddha sat beneath for I don't know how many years before he gained enlightenment. You see, so I'm dealing with connections like that, and I'm mm -hmm. not talking about mm -hmm. manipulating. I'm just talking about getting back into it. Mm -hmm. um, and as I'm conscious of the fact that, that man is evolved. I'm also, I also feel that natural system is evolving too. If the mm -hmm. two can get together, then that's what will come out of it. Mm -hmm. Because that's interesting what you're just saying, because you know you just pick up one type of conversation and uh, obviously you can follow it uh, with certain con you know, consistency. Now, I would like to make a very sort of simple, perhaps final comment, it's rather mundane. 
that, as I said at the beginning, I do admire of the attempt. Now, what it seems to me almost impossible is to try suddenly, in the middle of everything, you know, I mean, this is a sphere, it's a valve on its own, which has series of levels on which the same conversation is going on. I mean, from the biologists, from the very sort of uh, specialized specialists, you know, dealing with a particular issue like, uh, you know, the, the uh, endocrinology on one end, and then you go to the level of science fiction on the opposite end. Now, you know, I can obviously understand that, you know, what, there is a possibility in any of those levels to pick up the issue, follow it certain lengths, and translate it into language which you fancy as a language. I mean, you know, there is a language here, you know, whatever we describe it doesn't matter, you know, there is a language here which has a certain level because you can't operate at the same time in three, four, five different levels. I mean, you know, it came up from the conversation before that you can afterwards bring the second level into it, but it's an additional. You have to, you know, listen about that. We can't look at it. Now, you're looking at that language and trying, in fact, to do in, well, I would say a really impossible thing. I, I, I don't like to make finite statements, but impossible thing to, you know, go right across the whole spectrum of conversation from the very sort of minute specialist one on the left end and the science fiction on the other, bring it all together into one sort of, again, sort of command, commanding image. And, uh, you know, make a step, you know, further. Now, I believe that one, if it's, you know, it's possible at all, you can do it maybe somewhere on the way, but certainly not the beginning, because, uh, uh, you know, simply the image it itself has no the capacity, almost by definition, to go with the whole spectrum of, uh, you know, so detached sphere like the conceptual level of, of, uh, of uh, you know, genetics and uh, science fiction on the other end. See, that's the problem, because... Uh, you see, you find it in literature sometimes, you know, that it's brought together. And perhaps sometimes, it's only the first time I saw it in, you know, the attempt you do it, to bring it into a, a visual language. But the first thing is inevitably a hybrid. And now it depends what you do with the hybrid. And I think, you know, this comes to what I uh, uh, was talking before about, that, you know, it could be still taken as a very, very sort of promising, a uh, beginning of something which has no continuation yet. And I think it would be rather unfair to make, again, final statements about that stage, because I would like to believe that, uh, you know, for you it's not a end of the whole story. Exactly. Except, to me, the crucial thing is to keep it mm -hmm. on as many different levels as I can, because that, that will be the thing that tells whether it's successful or not. To get see, but again, I'm sorry to repeat the word, you know, the crucial point is the translation and the ability to do it, <coughs> to translate. Sure. So perhaps it's a, an impossible task. Because we are living there in vault of, 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 you know, grave fragmentation. Let's accept it and, you know, there's nothing great to, nobody to blame for that. It's, it's here. You know, so if you take it, fair enough, but it depends what you do with it. And you have to really translate before you can continue. Because otherwise you're operating permanently in a triplicit schizophrenia. I, I, I'm unhappy about this conversation. It's getting me depressed. And, and, the, and the unhappiness has something to do with the rejection of the people, everyone who's discussing the, the drawings, of, of the, the responses that their senses made to the drawings. And, and I, I would like to underline this point. I, I, I reserve the right that if I look at a drawing and think it's beautiful, that it remains beautiful as I, after I look into it. I reserve that first instinct of right, you know. If, I, I, I do feel that if we were confronted with a Blake drawing, that we would be saying how animate, anatomically ill-informed it was. <laughs> we didn't, hadn't seen enough naked ladies, you know. <laughs> and we didn't much care for his uh, branch of Christianity. We could very well get into that conversation, but curiously, the, the Blake drawings have, you know, have an immense power, you know. So, th th this, this point I, I would reserve in looking at all the drawings, but where I would agree with most of the people who've spoken about your Bath of Caracalla is that, that you've done something that is perhaps more serious 
than you imagine. But I think you have the right. I think an artist has the right to, to really do anything in, in his art, you know, because he, the, the field that he is operating in is understood by the, the observer. He, he can turn the world upside down. It's our understanding of the artist that it is within his rights and power of the canvas to do that. You know. But behind that, I, I do feel that you have done something dramatic and almost fearful, and that is that you have taken the whole of accumulated classical vocabulary, which is enveloped in the bath of Calabria, and you reduce them to, to an amorphous fluidity. <coughs> and this is a serious thing because as you look closer and closer at that intention, you, you are demolishing a whole speech, you know, a whole vocabulary. You are saying, I'm prepared to do that. I'm willing to discard it for the sake of th this, you know. And, and curiously, the, 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 the brashness of the statement, it's just curious, isn't it? Ends up in a pancake, isn't it? It is curious. In spite of the refinement of your hand and the, the thoughtfulness of, of, of your intelligence. It's also so that the mistake of the, or the rationale which produced a lot of those forms and geometries in the end is not all that far away from what you're possibly working towards, which is some kind of cosmology, some kind of abstraction of it, some kind of, uh, what is the expression, meaningful diagrams. And, uh, you know, it's good. Well, at the risk of, of throwing a cop into this entire conversation, and being very self-deprecating, I can say that when I did this project, I was not I was not aware of all the, uh, the conversations that had taken place prior in regard to the Caracalla Bass, and, and that, that the project was done as a uh, as a reaction to the, the building of a, of a civic center in Providence, which was nothing more than an auditorium and a restaurant. And I discovered, being a, an ignorant savage in the States, I discovered the Bass of Caracalla in a, in a book in the library, and it was, it was it was that minus all of the, the classical uh, dialogues that had taken place in the millennia between. <laughs> so you must be self deprecating. No. You happen to, you have instinctively chosen the, 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 the best example. <laughs> you know, you must, I'm going to be sure. <laughs> boring and, and seize that, that optimistic note as yeah. an excuse for moving <laughs> around the room. There are three more uh, sets of work. That we should look at. And I think it's quite useful, although Will Alsop is here, Cedric tells me that Will doesn't want to actually introduce this. Uh, Will is the guy in the blue pullover and beige jacket and pale blue shirt and longish hair, cheerful complexion, um, who remains anonymous in the corner there. Uh, he would be willing to answer questions or he may come in when there's time. But I think it's quite useful at this point to sort of break, try and break out of the the sort of AA jury formula because there will be three sets of things and quite usefully as we sort of shuffle around to look at the end of the room. Um, this, by most people's reckoning, is the most uh, straightforwardly architectural set of work here. The author is, isn't here, absolutely. Um, but I think in the Top left hand sheet, we have quite. Hey, something about it. Yes. This one, yes, my yes. What is that? This, uh, that's a scheme that was done um, at Piano Rogers um, in the first two weeks when we got a new job in. I was working there at the time too. It was a, it's a job. Uh, it was a science laboratory for P A T. PA management consultants, they are going to build a building, and they are currently building a building in Cambridge uh, for what they call the PAT Center, which is PA technology. So it's um, uh, a, a group of about 150 young scientists who are commissioned through PA management consultants.
consultants to develop uh, new new materials, or and then they need very specific rooms, such as rooms which are completely soundproof, or rooms which are completely uh, uh, completely dark, things like that. And uh, this was a scheme that uh, Alphonse produced in the first two weeks when. And it was in fact presented to the client, along with the building which is in fact being built by Piano Rogers. Um, but, uh, <laughs> but it wasn't supported by the firm, unfortunately, because uh, Richard was scared that the Richard Rogers was scared that the technology didn't exist to to, to do it. Um, and he was say, also worried. It was nothing. It was just an, an you know interesting project. No, I mean they. He, Richard was also worried that because it was a because it was a dome that uh, they wouldn't be able to develop a partitioning system which would um, uh, keep the building flexible. No, that, was the, that was the main problem. That was the main problem. You, Richard, Richard's buildings are all sheds where the partitioning system moves. Theoretically, move around in order to make different spaces, and this was uh, Richard Renzo's greatest uh, criticism of the building. Yeah. Uh, Bob, you, I mean, you've watched out for. Well, yeah, we've been in, 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 my, in our unit, and yeah, yeah. what's interesting about it is obsession, and uh, it'd probably be much more fair to 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 follow the sequence of the project. He started with the town hall, it was the first thing he produced in England, and. Uh, then he moved, the second thing was the competition project for the Vienna, for the island, the Danube. No, he did the uh, PA first, and then this one after. He did, he did it in the summer, this, this one. Yeah, this, so he, he did, did in August, I believe. But almost the same time, actually, almost the same time. But <laughs> yeah, it doesn't matter. <laughs> the secret of three projects, put it that way. And you know, the, you know, after all, you come to the point that the sequence, in fact, turns into the obsession, which I think is very interesting. And, uh, you know, the obsession of really uh, developing the structure into the absolute, absolute subtlety and, you know, the point where the structure is almost disappearing to introduce the scene of landscape. <coughs> and in fact, his main obsession afterwards was the possibility, you know, what you can do at the edges of natural and artificial landscape. In fact, going really at absurd room, uh, especially in the Cambridge project, when you have a uh, structure around the middle of, of a country, uh, you know, building the landscape right into, you know, being in the landscape already. And then in the middle, somewhere as a membrane, okay, as a structure. Now, you know, I don't want to say more about it because I'm rather biased about the project. I've been discussing it so often, it's been four times, so, you know, whatever you... I think what there's one on the second, the last one, sorry, to just to finish. You know, this is probably quite interesting. It's very much out of the, of the main, main, his main interest. He was involved <coughs> later on in rather mundane type of uh, research uh, uh, sponsored by some uh, German companies in, uh, in uh, the railway network Europe. A very large scale, monstrous, rather gigantic. I think you've got it wrong actually. Uh, this, well, you there. see, this, this scheme here is mm -hmm. in fact a station um, for the whole, it, it's, it's actually the final scheme for that one, which was the, the right. railway right. network. No, no, this is a Vienna competition. It doesn't <laughs> matter, <laughs> friends, it doesn't matter. <laughs> it really for, doesn't matter. I think that, that the parties. if I can hold you apart, it really doesn't matter. Yeah. But which case, mm -hmm. in the end. What I think is interesting is that if, if I can butt in rudely, is uh, it doesn't matter which came first, but I think what is interesting about Alf is the fact that he is um, working at a very literal level, whereas most of the other people in the room on the walls are working via one or other kind of metaphor. And that, to me, makes his work sometimes, it depends on what sort of mood one's in when it comes in in the morning, but some days it, it seems incredibly refreshing compared with the other work. Um, rather, rather straightforward. Rather, I mean, it, it, it wears its heart very much on its sleeves. It is what it is, and it doesn't conceal. And there's nothing kind of that's into the future or into the past. It is, you know, that section through that building is meant to be as, as, as nearly as possible a straightforward representation of the bits and pieces that make it up. 
And, and that, in a way, in, in the context of this exhibition, is almost uh, eccentric or curious. I don't know whether anybody wants to put that point up. I will. Yes. I, 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 I've seen it um, quite uh, And, and the, the, curious, the curious thing about it is that on, on the, when you first see them, you think, how mild is the draftsmanship? And on the, on, on the second side, you, you, you question the use to which the draftsmanship has been put. And, and I, I regard these drawings as a, a rather serious example of uh, addressing a great deal of skill to, towards buildings of mechanical and really uninventiveness. In this respect, that taking the top drawings there, it is most curious that as a drawing it gives you very little sense of what the building is, or could be, or might be. It communicates very, very little. What it does demonstrate is tremendous drafting skill. And as you look at the drawing, you, 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 you become uh, inebriated with the, the beautiful pencil line. And com compared to numerous pencil drawings that I can think of in architecture, it is singularly inept at communicating the architectural consequences. One can, one can, can see as a diagram that it is a monstrous and dreadful building. And, and th th these, th these times, my feelings about this uh, run right, right through our, all the drawings where one ends up with a really a bad translation of an archigram. In other words, the thought, the initial thought of, about what it's all about uh, has been quickly uh, taken, the, the, the initial decision has been quickly taken, and it's straight off with the drawing. Yes, I, I, I mean, I think, that's, that, I think that's terrible. I think it suffers from 95 indigestion or something. Um, the, taking uh, Jim's point on this, this web thing, I, I find very difficult for him to, to for explaining the building. In fact, anyone I really sort of start to understand is the section of the top, and that worries me. <laughs> because, you know, it doesn't seem to be really... When, when you see that there is a whole system whereby there's anchorage at the end, and I admire his style in cutting off the ends of the drawings, I do like that. Um, but where in fact there's a certain amount of, of um, anchorage and therefore uplift to see the tabulated sort of blurring of layers in the normal way on that section would make me, or did in fact make me when I saw these, because they're, they're delightful to look at as actual graphic patterns, try and understand more of the building from the other two, which are bigger and therefore perhaps have more in them. And you could get very little. On the other hand, we're not doing an AA crit. He might have put those up because he liked them. He might have lots of other drawings. And in listening to that last comment, I don't know, I, I, I'm a bit confused as to uh, how useful we are being. Um, I personally only want to comment on these, on these schemes where, in fact, I, I find delight in what I'm doing. And they reinforce it, or they pattern it. And therefore, this one, uh, here, I like because he's come up against a whole lot of problems that I come up against, <laughs> and, and the major one being this business of uh, a sort of that happens to be a triple layer building in a way. The whole business of how you end the thing, if in fact you have a sequence of building, and it's quite interesting that judging by his drawings on the right hand side, he actually has a structural justification for finishing in a particular way, rather than wanting to finish in a particular area and then finding a structure that would do it. As he isn't here, we will never know. But I do think that that panel is, is very informative, in fact. Therefore, on, on Jim's point, you know, I can I invent that perhaps there are other drawings related to that one up there. In general, if it's of any interest at all, I don't know why it should be. I, I don't like the 
little things like that. I, I, I can't sort of, if, if the purposes are right, there seems to be some disagreement as to what this third building was. Um, in, the, in the catalog, it says it's a pleasure island using old railway lines in the middle of a river, or something like that. Mm -hmm. well, so that's all I can do. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, on the, oh, the, the, on the scheme of the, the, the commuters lined around. Yeah. Yeah. But it's, 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 it's the end of the, it's the last thing he did of that scheme about the, the, the railway line and how he's going to adapt the railway system, the railway network. Yes. I mean, the point I was making, I don't think we should be giving marks. I think that is so arrogant and un unuseful. I think we should actually be saying bits that we find interesting or problems that we find or if we want to comment on the quality of drawing or whatever. Um, this, this sort of solution, which has been done far worse elsewhere than this one, um, makes one wonder why they took the job in the first place. If in fact, this, you know, because, uh, or it, it, actually it makes one wonder why scientists wanted a new building. Um, that's all I need. I, I think it might be useful, he says, to move on to the next scheme. Unless Danibor, who you want to make a you know, I, I, comment. I don't want to like, you know, extend the, the conversation. I think we are talking here about two things. We had several conversations with Alf and uh, Juris last year, so I think I know fairly well what he's after, not what he's saying, but what I understand his intentions are. You know, he came here as incredibly sort of well trained, uh, sort of almost structural engineer sort of level very good draftsman. Suddenly he came to AA, faces a situation which uh, you know, doesn't require in technical sense half of <coughs> the skills he had. And he was looking you know, what to do with the skill. In one sense, he was still, of course, very much interested in the kind of things like the Vienna, like the railway network, and going really into deep sort of investigation of all the logistics of large-scale system. You know, that's one thing. But another one, and in that sense, I would be very careful to use the word straightforward architecture. It's just uh, almost opposite, taking the architecture as an excuse to explore completely different problems which have to be judged, I mean, to be fair, in their own merit. You know, they are really exploring artistic problems quite clearly, at least, at least in his intention. You know, what he means by artistic is, of course, uh, defined by what he's doing. But uh, he was definitely trying to see, you know, what you can do with the structure. That's why, in fact, he's doing things which technically is absolute nonsense, and he was not stupid not to know that, you know, that you don't draw the structure, you know, still structuring that scale with all these details lying there. You do it for a purpose. So it's not just for the sake of information, it's the sake for the presentation of a completely different idea and intention. And then, of course, the <coughs> notion of landscape, which is unfortunately very badly illustrated here. It's got some better drawings when it comes out. You know, and he's really trying to investigate all the possibilities of the interference. And that's what he, you know, he was really obsessed with. And perhaps almost quite well illustrated by the failure of the Cambridge project. And it came out almost as an applied cliche. But again, it illustrates, you know, in a return or back, the obsession he had in mind, you know, which is far apart if you compare these two drawings at the bottom. You know, there are two different worlds. And this says the story for the So that's what I would say. Yeah, yeah, I think that may be the sad thing. But yeah. they're, they're very feeble subject matter, mm. which might not be his fault. You know, the mm. burgers of Northampton, mm. dreary scientists outside Cambridge, and God knows what, whether it's people selling railway lines or, or council land in the middle of the river again. You know, they, this is what's said. Mm -hmm. but Possibly if it had better. I think I don't know the man's work, the rest of his work, but by choosing not only to work at projects which have little content and have absolutely no context within which to uh, mm -hmm. work, and to get involved in a few experiments construction and perhaps linear organization uh, is indicative in a sense of what everybody has said you know um, what is lacking is a prototypical problem that's being worked on so, mm -hmm. and, and I think it also possibly to go further in a sense given uh, you know Peter's attempt to put together an exhibition of this sort which covers a certain range you know from you know, mysticism possibly biological mysticism to hard building to this and that, but it's very difficult <coughs> uh, at short notice or even at long notice to find uh, a piece of work which 
is uh, tensely organized, seems carefully built and could be carefully designed so it could be built in our time, which occupies the mind of people of that generation. Sad. Well, let's let's move on to. The note says, I think Shepherd hopes that all have read his blurb. Also. Also. Yeah. 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 Yeah.